Hello. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hope you guys are having a fun time at the Gavaverse of Fathom Summit Day 1. And on this panel today, we're going to be talking about the metaverse and the AI's role in music. So, uh, without further ado, I'm just going to give everyone 30 seconds to quickly introduce yourselves. And we'll start with Christopher to my right, who is the founder of Gavaverse. So, Christopher, do you want to quickly introduce yourself? Hey, what's up, everyone? It's Christopher Lafayette, founder of Gatherverse, servant leader. Happy to be here with these brilliant minds today where we lean in and talk about some incredible things that are happening in the world of music and AI. Um, that's it. That's what I got. <laughs> I will see you, Anna. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much to Christopher for having me and for Russell to present. And obviously for Adrian, who I'm excited to chat with today. Um, yeah, I work in the music industry, uh, passionate about music and its possibility, the, the possibility of music changing everything, um, as I think it always has and I think it always will. So. And over to you, Adrian. Uh, peace, everybody. Uh, Adrian Rashad Driscoll, um, co-founder of Collimation. Uh, happy to be here, you know, excited about extending the artistic spectrum, um, whatever that may look like for now and in the future. So I'm ha happy to be here. Thanks for having me. And I'll just quickly introduce myself. My name is Russell. I am the director of arts for Gavaverse and also the CEO and president of Mabob, which is a women focused NFT music platform. And we're using Web3 technology to change uh, thing, uh, things for women uh, inside the music industry, such as like the royalty side and making all different re revenue from NFTs, Metaverse, all that kind of, sort of stuff. So, all right, let's get into discussion, shall we? This is a very interesting topic today, so I'm very excited to talk about this. So, I'm going to start with Anna. Not to pick on you, Anna, <laughs> um, but we'll start with you, Anna. How has AI changed the process of music creation and production? It's a good question. And thank you for picking on me, Russell. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think it has changed the, the amount of people involved in music production. So we've seen a huge change in stats now, looking at 66% of musicians using AI to make their music. So that is like a huge, huge uh, percentage. Um, obviously making it maybe easier to press that button and get results, right? So the mm. positive in my view is immediately there is that more people are making music. So I see that as a really helpful tool to make music more accessible and to make an end product more accessible to more people. Um, the more people that are, you know, creating tracks and creating music, the better. So yeah, an increase in, in the amount of musicians out there making tracks is probably what I think is the main change so far. I was going to say as well, because I think um, Ryan was also one of the first artists to actually do AI with music. Uh, and uh, she incorporated it, um, allowed people to use basically her voice um, in, in different songs and various songs. So I'm pretty sure she was one of the first people to actually integrate the AI voice um, as far as I know. So uh, it's very interesting to to see that. So um, we'll go over to you, Christopher. Um, what is your thoughts on the AI changing the music creation and process? Because uh, I know you have a lot of thoughts on this and we've had discussions over the phone as well. So uh, <laughs> let's hit it out of the park. <laughs> sure. And, you know, Adrian and I have had, you know, several discussions in previous summits before on this very subject before. And, you know, as I think about the succession of the adoption of technology when it comes to the arts, this was something that was bound to happen at some point anyway. Uh, you know, we've gone from reel to reel to CD, you know, excuse me, reel to reel to cassette to CD and a track. You know, I mean, we're talking about what does the flow of the music industry in its entirety look like in one particular vertical versus the transition to an age 
you know, we've gone from the farming age to the industrial age, from the industrial age to the technology age, and now we're heading firm into the artificial intelligent age. And mm. I think what tends to happen is that we get so rooted, firm to fixed in our industry of process, because that's part of the question. We think about process, and this is how it's operating and as, and as it would be or should be. But the reality is, is that there's still a volatility in the way of work. You know, the way of work is changing. And, you know, we must know that not all of this will stay the same, but that's not what we were told growing up. You know, we were more firm to fix in getting school education and then getting a career and that was it. But the reality is, is that the very notion of career itself is being challenged. What is a career in the mm -hmm. face of these emerging technologies, these tools of innovation? What does that even translate and look like today? And so uh, the reality is, is that our arts are under fire. Um, my hope is that we're going to a place of growth as opposed to a place of attrition. And we have to realize that the day of the 90s, we're... Artists will drop an album and platinum plaques were on the walls decorated through and throughout. Those, those days are done. There, there's been some, um, sorry just to jump in, but there's, uh, there's some interesting stats recently. Um, there was actually a news article that come out recently about how people are creating AI music and uploading them to platform, streaming platforms like Spotify, Apple Music, etc. And the record labels are trying to fight back against that by controlling these platforms and trying to stop them. But they're, it's just not working. Like the, the amount of content that's going to be uploaded and stuff, they, they won't be able to stop it or they won't be able to, uh, you know, be able to process that amount and to, to stop everything being uploaded. So, Adrian, um, from your point of view, I'm, I'm, sh I'm assuming you're a producer, right? And you do production side too or part of it. Okay. Well, let's, let's go a bit of the more production side. From a producer point of view, how how do you see that correlating for yourself from like a producer's point of view? Like, do you see your career, you know, being stopped and up for grabs and or stopping that? Or do you think AI is actually enhancing you and, and allowing you to build more? I, I mean, I, I think this is one of the biggest questions that's everywhere, right? Um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of fear and that's, that's all anybody sees right now is kind of the, hey, this is scary, this is scary, you know? And as an artist, as a producer, these are tools, you know, just like anything else has always been a tool. You know, you can use it for something positive or you can use it for something negative, you know, but the technology isn't inherently one way or the other. It's, it's really the way that people are using it. And to your point of, you know, simulating artists' voice and, and what, the, what the record labels are trying to do, I think the big, the big thing is we need to figure out a policing system, you know, something that scans it kind of like if I... If I post my own song um, or post some own songs to Instagram, it's going to say, no, 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 you can't do that. You know, the, the same kind of the mm -hmm. same kind of system can be set into place and kind of police it. But it's a very, very useful and powerful tool, in my opinion. I actually have a friend of mine who's actually uh, building that sort of uh, similar tool that you're saying about. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll introduce you to him and, and you can have a chat with him. Um, yeah. But yeah, let's let's talk about. Um, I want to kind of give, go a bit more deep on that, Adrian, actually, um, because I want to talk about, you know, can AI create original, like, emotion and, and be able to resonate with that music? Or is it just like a, just a tool only? And that's it. Like, how you say it? AI is only a tool. A AI, is, AI is not sentient. You know, a lot of people try to make it seem like it is. You know, it's, it's, it's rapidly growing, um, but... It's it's only it's only a tool. The now there are a lot of prompts, and I think that's another big reason. You know, you have the, the two strikes, one simultaneously. There's a lot of prompts that can be fed by very thought provoking and emotion provoking music that can you know feed into AI, and AI can try to replicate it. But AI cannot. AI can't create anything as far as e emotion invoking because it's it's only going based off of language learning models and prompts. It's it's only a tool, at least for now. <laughs> Just to jump in on that, I totally agree with you, Adrian. Um, 
I was thinking about it the other day uh, when I was reading about the origin of the song Wild Horses by uh, Rolling Stones. And I was thinking it's really similar to AI, right? Because uh, the story is that Keith Richards uh, had a, his first kid and he said wild horses couldn't drag him away from from his, his child to go on tour, right? So Jagger used that emotion of the love that he had for his kid to convey another emotion, which was the breakup in the song, right? Um, and it's like using... We we can we can use this tool to find emotions to under to to learn about other people's emotions and then use that tool and connect with it essentially, um, you know, not to to break it off as something like that's completely in an inanimate, right? Okay, I don't want to go too Shinto on it, but <laughs> you know, there's a level of 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 life and of an essence to it that we can tap into and uh, the human emotion that's there. And, and use it in, in that sense as a tool. Um, it could be a positive way to look at it as well. Over to you, Christopher. I know you want to jump on this, so go ahead. Sure. You know, I, I think about a tool. You know, the reality is, is that when we think about all these emerging technologies that abide within the eco-habitat itself, when I think about all these tools, as Adrian appropriately expressed, uh, gender and free trade transformers, large language foundational models. We think about all the things that we use when it comes to HMDs, when it comes to all these different tools. Let's lean in on that a little further, you know, because the reality is, is as advanced as these tools are that we use today, we will one day look back at these things that we find so profound with the relevancy of a hammer, of a, of a mm -hmm. drill, you know, they're tools, but they're, they're different apart. And what we've really done on the scientific level, because we have to realize that we're, that, that artificial intelligence, uh, spatial computing, these aren't products. These are applied sciences. And what we've done is we've gone into science itself We've extracted it from its abstract state and made these tools, which shows that it's been made in concrete form from these sciences. And we take these tools to go back into discovery of what science is. And that's what leads us into physics and so forth and so on. And so in some capacity, these things that we're entangled with, these things that we use are very rudimentary that they're very much still in their infancy, these tools that we're using. And so when we think about music as we know it today, might we say the self-same thing when it comes to how we've enjoyed music all of our lives and that we're actually afforded the opportunity to go further by way of these tools to expand on music that we've never even fathomed or even conceived of ever. And it's exciting to understand that we're heading into such unknown territory when it comes to unlocking and understanding the native intimacy of music itself. It makes me feel as if I don't even know what music is. Mm, that's a really interesting topic to go into because I was actually reading a BBC article, right? And obviously it needs to be, so it needs to be humanity first, right? hundred percent. And I was reading an article uh, about a DJ and saying, and they, were, and they were asking in the BBC news article going, well, I, aren't you worried about AI, like taking your position as a DJ? And she was like, no. And then, and then they was like, why? And she goes, because they will never have that human connection that the human would compared to AI. And I was like, that's actually true. She goes, when someone is dancing on the dance floor and they see the DJ behind the DJ booth, sweating away, dancing away, having a great time, yeah. that connection right there cannot be replicated. Right. And that is like the bit that could never be tampered with or changed or anything. So 
that kind of leads me on to mm. my next question, mm. which is, can, uh, well, we did briefly talk about that how AI can't have the emotional resonation with music, etc. But can AI become so smart, though, that they become human-like in the future that they do end up looking like humans? They do end up being like humans, etc. Is that a possibility? It's very much a possibility. It's been the attentions of technical evolution since the earliest mentionings of what we think about when it comes to deployed AI. You know, we think about artificial general intelligence, AGI, and we think about super intelligence, you know, which we haven't reached. I do believe that we've reached AGI. I do believe that the corporations will not express publicly that we have touched on AGI. Um, the okay, evidence supports it. There's a there's a great debate that's happening, and, and he's gone. <laughs> um, yeah. So Anna, I'm just going to quickly fire over to you. What what's your thoughts on on this particular topic? Like, do you think that the AI can perform like a human? That they can have that connection the same as a human to human? Okay. So my thoughts on this are that it's it's the idea in itself is kind of humbling and it's it's exciting in a way because i've always wondered about what our position on earth is right like what who we are and and you know why we're here and and all of that kind of thing and and from a philosophical perspective you know you meditate you do what you do to try and figure things out or you you, you connect with people but like i've always just thought well we've evolved from from other animals we share so much dna with other animals like why why are we that so much better and all right it, it might be possible i don't know how because i'm i'm not i don't understand the tech at that level okay mm. but i guess yeah. in my view it, it could be just a, a another form of evolution so it's the next step in evolution and in my mind what we should be more focusing on is how to make that transition if it does happen, which I think is pretty likely, um, as seamless as possible. And yeah, to, to feed the right kind of empathy and compassion into this into this future. Because, you know, the earth, the, the, the cosmos will continue without us. Who, the, who are we to ever decide how things will go? Like, I just... It's unfathomable, mm. unfathomable to me, but um, yeah. Go ahead, Christopher. Jump back in. <laughs> You're back again. <laughs> You're good. I think some of us, one of us has to get some Starlink up in this camp. But no, I, I, I think Anna was, <laughs> Anna was definitely on point in seeing it. I'll say this: that when I start thinking about the intentions of artificial intelligence, where we're at with AGI, yes, it will start to replicate human expression. No, we will not be able to take it to the level of what we've known intimately because we cannot create sensory, sensory output. It cannot duplicate human senses. That is the ultimate mm. great divider when it comes to the dichotomy between human. Listen, let's make sure we're clear, audience, for all the many of you that are in Gatherverse not live right now. I want to make sure that this is clear. When we talk about extended reality, we're, all, we're not only talking about hyper-realistic, immersive, simulated environments or virtual augmented reality. Artificial intelligence comes from human intelligentsia. Therefore, it is an extended reality also. These extended realities can only go so far. And this is why we have Gatherverse. It's because humanity first, for whom we have been building these tools in the first place for to make this reality and this existence better and to be able to serve humanity and not the and never the other way around. And so this is why we bring up awareness when we talk about our musicians, because we have to think about, are we about to disrupt our own selves from our lust of disruption itself? When it comes to mm -hmm. music and the assault of creativity and arts, for us to be able to go on assault when it comes to arts, it's for us to be able to shoot our own selves in the foot. Well said, Christopher. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, well said. Um, Beautiful. Yeah. Um, which kind of leads me on to my next question. 
which is obviously we haven't covered the topic yet, which is the metaverse. So mm. how is the metaverse reshaping the music industry? Adrian, I'm going to hand this one over to you. Sure. Uh, thank you. So right now what the metaverse is doing is very similar to what streaming did, you know, what YouTube did, what uh, a lot of these technologies did. It's providing a lot more access. You know, if, if you look at the way that uh, typically you'd have to go and sell CDs out of your trunk, and I'm, I'm dating myself, or not CDs even, because I mean, this is cassettes, this is eight tracks, you know, that, that was how you got known, right? And, and then, you know, someone would send a letter, <laughs> and then, you know, it, it would, and it would kind of progress from there. Um, now it's, you can literally make a song, you know, on your computer at home, you know, you could do everything, you could do all the vocals, all the instruments, from something as simple as GarageBand, right? And you can put a track out there. You make a music video. You can do all you can do all these things that's creating access. Now, that same access lets me, or this new access lets me have a concert, which is kind of what Collimation does, you know, in a, in a large sense, have a concert with people who couldn't typically get a ticket, right? So my $2,500 ticket for a VIP red carpet is now 10 bucks, you know? So it's, it's creating access and making it so that your audiences can become so diverse in a way that was never possible before. And that's one of the most um, prevalent and interesting parts of, of the metaverse when you compare it or you include it in the music space, in my opinion. That's a really, sorry, that's a really interesting uh, perspective. And um, I'm just going to jump on this too. I think it has a really good social impact too, right? And allowing people to gather together that could never gather before, that be able to socialize with each other, be able to interact with each other. Not only that, but also creating new experiences from an events point of view, right? Yeah. The fact that you can have a massive show, you can have your virtual stream inside the metaverse, and you can still be your character as if you was there, but you're like you're not, obviously, but <laughs> you're virtually there kind of thing, and still be able to have as close to that real life experience as possible. Mm. I think that's mm. a huge game changer in the middle mm. of us. Mm. And mm. I want to bring this over to Anna. Mm. <laughs> so Anna, what is your perspective on the middle of us? Because me and Adrian have gave our perspectives and, and together. So what is your opinion on maybe everything that we've said, or maybe you have a complete different perspective than what we have? Yeah, no, I definitely agree with you guys. Um, I also think it's, you know, poignant to add that um, it could be, again, it is a tool. It's still a tool. And it is one that could be massively beneficial to artists, especially when, if you think about young artists in particular, maybe having, you know, confidence issues, they can they can use their avatar to develop their skills as well. And then I, I still think that live will be extremely important, like full live and it should be. And even going to events for me and actually just like, you know, like we were talking about the sensory aspect of it already, it's just so important. But these can be combined together to make something really powerful. So you give the artists that, you know, capacity to express themselves mm. in the metaverse as well. You know, uh, it's it's a really nice opportunity. I think that that's something we've seen in gaming as well already throughout the years, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. People developing communities in the gaming space. And then they go and they meet their friends from the gaming community and they, they feel stronger sure. together. Um, so I think, again, it's going to be something that will impact life better. Mm -hmm. You know, it will help people with that sense of community and with potentially with mental health as well. Um, so I'm just looking at all of that kind of side of thing. And I think it's going to be really positive. I think the monetization side as well is going to be astronomical for creators too. Mm. And new ways in making streaming revenue, new ways in making ticketing revenue, and new ways in making merchandise revenue, which is like the biggest you know income that most artists have when they're going on tour. Like that's where they make all that money. Right. So I think this is going to be a huge game changer for them as well mm -hmm. and allowing them to be able to make a living from creating, you know, their content and their music. Right. So, and, and, and Christopher, um, 
I want to bring this back to you because I know you have a lot of opinions on the metaverse and for creators. Just give us your perspective on on what you think on on how it's going to change things for the creators. Is it going to be positive? Is it going to be negative? What, what's your personal opinion? I'll fall right in line with what Adrian and Anna just expressed, which is so apropos uh, accessibility and education. That's at the top of the list. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is at the prime top of the list for the use case of the metaverse today, as we know it, uh, this colloquial metaverse and and spatial computing, extended reality, immersive intelligence. The reason that that's so important for what they just expressed is one, you're giving greater access to an art form that most, that uh, many people and we're talking millions still cannot access and largely due to a lack of supply and available broadband, mm-hmm. right? You know, that's a big issue. So I'd like to see what does the metaverse look like when we have 5G, <laughs> you know, and, and I go to certain places <laughs> and, you know, even in Europe, you know, that's lacking in, 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 in our European communities, let alone Africa, Middle East uh, and subsequent Asia, you know, and even places here within North America as well. The other part of it is, is going to, so that's on the accessibility side. What happens when you give communities that have never had access? What happens when we have the opportunity to unlock their culture? That right. feels right over hand in hand with what Anna just talked about. Unlocking within, I know Dr. Furness, Dr. Tom Furness, a virtual world.